Welcome this morning. There are a number of folks who are out today, uh, cold and flu season. I don't think anybody has the big bad C word, but uh, there are a number with sniffles. And so I think as is appropriate in this particular time, that folks when they have a, a sniffle are better safe than sorry. So uh, there are a number who are out today. So keep those of you, uh, those who you know of in prayer as well as some who are traveling. A few things to mention. Uh, next week we will observe, or I'm sorry, this week we observe the Lord's Supper. When I was making the bulletin, I was thrown off, and so the bulletin says next week we'll observe the Lord's Supper. That is not the case. It is this week, as it always is, the first Sunday uh, or the first Lord's Day of each month. Uh, so today will be the Lord's Supper. Uh, you're welcome to participate with us in the Lord's Supper. If you have made a profession of faith in Christ, if you're a member of a Bible-believing church, and if you are walking faithfully with the Lord. We do need Sunday school teachers again. Ask, uh, or you can mention that to Tessa if you're able to help with Sunday school teachers. And our Wednesday evening prayer meeting will continue this week. We were off the last couple of weeks, but we will continue this week at 7 o'clock. So I hope you can make it at 7 for our Wednesday evening prayer meeting and continuing also in our study of church history, uh, looking at a fellow by the name of Origen, today, who I'll mention in the sermon. A good thing I'll mention in the sermon about Origen today. Uh, there are a few odd things about Origen that we're talking about in Wednesday uh, church history class. We'll be doing that at seven o'clock here Wednesday. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, let's stand together and let's be called to worship the Lord. I will give to the Lord the thanks due his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. In your bulletin, you'll find an insert uh, with the hymn entitled, Rejoice, All Ye Believers. Let's sing this together.
us pray. Lord God, we have so many things to be thankful about concerning your love, mercy, your grace, and watchfulness over us. In a time where the visible church has had difficulty with meeting together and worshiping you this past year, you have provided means for the invisible church to still praise and worship together. Here at Wolf River, you have been so very gracious in that we have been able to meet unchallenged with little interruption over this past year, and so we are very thankful, Lord, that you have kept us close to you. While other churches have met or haven't met in months, you have allowed us to grow in number. It is because of your righteousness and love for us that we sing praises to you. We praise, Father, that you would please bless our worship for you today. We pray, Lord, that as we sit and listen, you would build us up in our faith that you have blessed us with. Strengthen us and nourish us, Father, with the power of your gospel today. We pray for those who are dead in their sin to be made alive with the power of the Holy Spirit who uses your word to bring new birth. Lord God, we pray these things with hearts full of gratitude and in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our New Testament scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Hear God's word. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. On page 851 of your hymnal, you'll find the Apostles' Creed. Turn there. We'll recite this together again this morning. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go to the Lord now in a time of confession and supplication. We enter into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And having come now before the Lord, before our holy God, let us confess our sins so that wrapped in the robes of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, we may have full communion with God and know his presence. Let's pray. Our gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the assurance of pardon that you give us in your word that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are unrighteous people. We are sinners as each of us has confessed as we come, even as we come into membership in this church. We are asked, are you a sinner? We acknowledge our sin. It is ever before us. Ever before us is the fact that we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us, in ourselves, but only your Holy Spirit. And so as we come, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would take the Word of God and work it in our hearts. We pray that the lesson that we learned today from the third chapter of Daniel may point us to Jesus Christ not to ourselves, not even to the three 
characters in the story, heroes of the faith, but ultimately to Jesus, that we might know him, that we might look to him, that we might know his presence, that we might live unto him and walk in obedience to him. Lord, we ask then that you would be with those who can't be with us today. We think particularly of those who aren't feeling well, those families that are suffering from the uh, typical cold and flu season that uh, comes around every year, or usually a couple of times. We're thankful uh, that no one appears to be uh, suffering from uh, COVID or any of that, but uh, just the typical sniffles. But at this time, when we get nervous whenever we sniffle, uh, we pray that you would be with those who can't be with us. Raise them back to health. Encourage them uh, today as uh, they uh, surely long to be in your house, as many of them will tune in to the service this morning. We pray that you would encourage their hearts through the word, that you would strengthen them through the word. And to strengthen us, we pray then to go about the work that you've called us to do, to be a good testimony of the gospel in our communities, in a world that knows fear, in a world that is afraid of so many things, seen and unseen. We pray that we might show to them what it means to have confidence, not in this life only, but confidence in the life which is to come, confidence in Jesus Christ, who, as we saw last week, conquered death, who overcame death by his own resurrection, that we might know life in Jesus Christ. We pray now that you would take the word of God as it is read and as it is preached and work it in our hearts, that by faith we might receive it and offer you the glory in all things. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Daniel. Chapter 9 and verse 9, a familiar assurance of pardon. I've read this uh, several times after the prayer of confession. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. The Lord grants those of you who have confessed your sin. He grants to you the forgiveness of sin. Once again, we normally take our tithes and offerings at this time. It is part of worship, and today uh, there is no offering box in the back, so we will try to remember to put that uh, back there to uh, put your tithes and offerings in the little cardboard box that sits back where the hymnals usually are and where the box usually is. Uh, we'll try to get that out there before the end of the service. You can also give online or uh, give that to Larry or mail that to Larry who deposits those as well as you're able to do that. Let's stand together and let's prepare to worship the Lord. Psalm 7 this morning. I enjoy our new Trinity Psalter. We got these, I think, sometime in this past year. We haven't sung every one of the psalms, of the 150 psalms that are here, uh, but we're singing number seven today. O Lord, my God, and you, I refuge seek.
Psalm 7. I don't recall ever having sung that before, certainly not that tune. I picked it because it matches what we're looking at today in Daniel chapter 3. If you'll turn with me to Daniel 3, we finished uh, Luke chapter 8. We're preaching through the Gospel of Luke, and we finished chapter 8 uh, last week. And before we go on to chapter 9, I want to take a look here at the third chapter of the book of Daniel. Over the past year, in just about every one of our bulletins this year, there's been a flyer that is put out by a group called Open Doors. It gives us a world watch list of the 50 countries where it is most dangerous to follow Christ. And the list began with North Korea, a country with a population of about 26 million, where there are estimated to be only about 300,000 Christians, and that's Christians of every stripe. It's difficult to tell how many there are because they are so severely persecuted. Some of them martyred, some of them moved out of North Korea, fleeing persecution. We learned that many of China's 415 million surveillance cameras are focused in on Christians, Christians who undergo persecution from the government, who are severely punished, uh, who are ostracized through the government's social credit system. We learned that in Iraq, where once there had been a million and a half Christians, in one generation, that number was reduced to just a couple hundred thousand. According to Pew Research, whether harassment or limits on religious activity or violence, Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world, and incidents of persecution continue to grow year after year. Around the world, millions of Christians are arrested, evicted, or attacked for their faith. They're intimidated, interrogated, imprisoned, beaten, burned, beheaded, stoned, raped, knifed, killed. It's been estimated that more Christians were martyred for their faith in the 20th century than all other centuries combined. And about a quarter of the way or a fifth of the way, I guess, through the 21st century, things aren't much better. In Burkina Faso, a West African country that borders on Nigeria, 45-year-old pastor's wife, Naomi, lost her husband while he was gunned down and traveling to see another pastor friend, and she was left without her husband, their nine children left without a father. And still, she said, day and night, we keep meeting at the church to offer out to God, to cry out to God, to remember us and to send us help. God answers our prayers. He promised never to leave us or forsake us. That's what Daniel 3 is about, the presence of God with his people. It's a presence that we need to know. Persecution isn't always on foreign soil. God's been pleased to place us, I think, in a part of the world where, at least at the moment, we have only a little, but certainly a growing threat of persecution. From merchants to academics to freedom on college campuses to churches particularly being singled out for enacting pandemic restrictions, persecution might be minor where we are, but it's increasing. And it's nothing new. It is the way of the cross. We've learned so far in Luke, and we've learned certainly in chapter 8, that the kingdom of Christ is not the way the people imagine it to be a political, a geographical victory. The kingdom of Christ is the kingdom of the cross. It's a kingdom of suffering. Christ assures us that if he suffered, so he also will suffer. Unto you it has been given as a gift of God on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but then also to suffer for his sake. We certainly are familiar with suffering in the Bible. We know about it in the persecutions that are listed in Scripture, the martyrdom of Stephen, the martyrdom of the apostles, the martyrdoms of the early church. Polycarp, we looked at for one example. We looked at so many of them in our Wednesday evening lessons on church history. And upcoming are others, John Huss, the Scottish Covenanters, many, many, many others. Our Old Testament lesson is a picture of such persecution, but above all, it is a picture of Christ. It is a picture of the character of these men who faced death, but it provides for us a picture of our faithful Savior. 
who faces death on our behalf and is faithful to the end. And then this passage also provides for us an example of a faithful witness in a faithless world. I'm going to go ahead and read this whole story. It's practically the chapter, Luke chapter 3, or sorry, Daniel, so used to saying Luke every Sunday morning. Uh, But Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 8, I want to read down to verse 30. Listen to the reading of God's holy and infallible word. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree. And every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, Well and good, but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue In this way, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we look at this really a massive story with so much in it and such a little time that we have, that we might hit some of the high points of it, the highest point of all, that we might see Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, here's the uh, biblical story of three martyrs who were not martyred. Just a quick word about context. 
at the time of the writing of Daniel, the book of Daniel, at least at the time of Daniel's ministry, the nation of Israel has gone into captivity to Babylon because of their disobedience. They are finally disinherited from the land, just as God promised they would be, because they hadn't obeyed God. They had bowed down to false gods. They hadn't kept his commands as they should have kept them. And so God sends them into captivity in Babylon. It's about 600 years before Christ. And some of the Israelites remained in the promised land, but many more of them had been carried off to Babylon in 605. And Daniel was among the first group of the Israelites who were carried off into captivity. And they had to make their home in Babylon. They're deported from their homeland. They're now in a foreign country. They've got to make that their home. And it's difficult, to say the least, but you make do. And the Israelites were to make the best of their captivity. As Jeremiah says, they were to seek the welfare of Babylon. That's where they live now. Like Christians today, we're pilgrims. We're not in our home country yet. We're journeying toward it. But like Christians today, we are to be productive citizens, even while maintaining as they were to maintain a distinct and separate identity as the people of God. And Daniel does this. He does this and his friends do this admirably. Daniel becomes a leader in Babylon. He becomes one of the respected men of wisdom. Daniel, he didn't try to seek acceptance within Babylonian culture. Nevertheless, he finds it because of his integrity. And Daniel had three friends who were also advisors to the king. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They enter into the king's service. The first chapter of Daniel tells us, and the king found these men to be 10 times better than all of the magicians and all of the wise men and all of the advisors and enchanters in his whole kingdom. These four, 10 times better than any of them, without equal. But there's tension now. And the tension in the plot here in our text is introduced when Nebuchadnezzar makes a huge gold statue and then insists that everybody bow down and worship it. Not a problem if you're a Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar is divine. Naturally, he makes a statue, presumably of himself, or imagines the head of it to be himself, and then people are told to worship the statue. Not a problem. We have many gods. Add another one to the collection, especially a big one, especially one that resembles the king. It's a good idea to worship that God. Not the children of Israel, however, not the people of God, because we have the second commandment. Thou shalt not make any graven images. You shall not bow down to them. And the text indicates that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's the Babylonian names for Daniel's three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. This is told from the perspective, in some ways, this is from the perspective of Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel is using their Babylonian names. And the, it, it, it seems as though these three nonconformists who don't bow down when everybody else bows down could have gotten away with it. But there's professional jealousy. There are informants, and the informants are described as Astrologers, probably their professional colleagues, jealous. Jealous of the fact that these three foreigners have now come into Babylon and been, been respected and given positions of authority and had such political clout. So I want to see three things that happen here. First, the demands that are made on the Israelites, the decision made by them, and then the deliverance of God's people. First, the demands made on God's people, verses 12 through 15, Nebuchadnezzar uh, issues a call. And the call goes out for satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other officials. And we see this four times in this chapter. I should say a number of times, at least in this chapter, the, the instruments are listed. But there's a rather imposing list of government officials repeated several times. And the list is to, to heighten the literary effect of that is to heighten the tension that is here, the pressure that is being put on them. This is the whole government of Babylon. This is every person of influence in Babylon. This is every ruler and advisor in Babylon, all the officials of Babylon. And this is peer pressure is what it is. Everybody bows down. And there's a tremendous sense of danger then that is present. One commentator says this, through repetition, the narrator creates a scenario in which conformity is normative and disobedience is unthinkable. 
There's another lengthy list in this passage, and that's the list of instruments. It's also repeated four times, five, seven, ten, fifteen. The horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, every kind of music. And why does it list that thing four times? To, to give you a sense of the pomp, of the ceremony, to heighten again the tension of it. This is a big deal. The stadium is filled. Thousands of people are assembled. The music begins to swell. People are excited about this idol. In the midst of all of this fanfare, we read in verse 7 that all of the peoples, nations, languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All of them. Remember, this is written from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. This is what he sees as he looks out. He sees all of them bowed down. He looks at the stadium, as it were, filled with people. That's his perspective. But what he doesn't notice is three who do not. Verse 7 reports, everybody worships the image. That's Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. But there's an accusation then that are made against some of the Jews. We don't know about other Jews. We only know about three of them. There must have been other Jews present. Did they conform? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. Were there other Jews there? We can't be certain of that. It doesn't tell us. Where's Daniel? Did Daniel conform? Presumably not, but probably isn't here. Where is he? Who knows? Maybe he's on official business. Maybe he's on vacation for the week, but he wasn't there at that particular time. What we do know is these three, what we can discern from the text is what motivates these professional colleagues of these three men. And the hint comes when they're describing the three Jews in verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, Pay no attention to you. They don't serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Certain Jews you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. What is this? This professional jealousy. Remember chapter 1? Cyrus found Daniel and his friends to be ten times better than any of the magicians. So they do what motivates people who are jealous, motivated by professional jealousy. What do they do? They appeal to their superior's sense of vanity. Right? Verse 12, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They don't serve your gods. They don't worship the golden image that you have set up. And these colleagues of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they, they turn their commitment to God into a personal affront against Nebuchadnezzar. This is a personal attack against you, Nebuchadnezzar. And that works. It usually does when you appeal to somebody's vanity. It works, and that's why they do it. And Nebuchadnezzar is an insecure person. He has an iron grip on the lives and on the fortunes of those under him. Recall chapter 2. He threatens to destroy the lives. He threatens to destroy the homes of his counselors if they can't tell him what his dream was. This is a man who holds the fortunes of thousands in his fingers. But he's insecure. And his insecurity is further seen in the, in the happiness that he finds after learning that in the previous chapter that, that he is the head of the God in the image that Daniel interprets for him. I'm the one who's at the top. And maybe motivated by that dream that he has of that golden image or of that image, motivated by that is his construction of this image and forcing the worship of the golden statue and forcing the worship of Nebuchadnezzar himself, essentially translated in today's language and forcing the worship of the state. The state is higher than everything. It is the most powerful institution. You must bow down to it. And he immediately has the leadership of the country brought in then for a loyalty test. And that's what this is. So the demand then that is made on the Israelites as they appear before him is seen then in verses 13 and 15. Nebuchadnezzar in a furious rage, verse 13, commands that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. That accusations made, bring them over here. So he brought them before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true? O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up. If you're ready to answer when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good, I'll let you off. If you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? 
It's an interesting demand that Nebuchadnezzar makes on these three. He tells them that they have freedom of worship. He doesn't tell them to deny their God. He doesn't tell them to stop worshiping their God. He doesn't tell them to deny their religion. They could still be religious. He merely demands that they recognize his image, his religion. And not only recognize it, but bow down to it. You can be religious, just don't be so narrow. Don't merely accept what I have to offer, but to be in obeisance to it, obey. Nebuchadnezzar's demand was simply that you include my religion with yours. That you include man's religion with your religion. A union of God's truth and Nebuchadnezzar's image. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? They don't have to deny their God. They can still worship the Lord. They can go to Sabbath worship in Babylon, such as it is. All they have to do is accommodate this cultural image. Look at the decision then this made in the Israelites. The tension, the tension rises even higher. Remember the tension of the, of the music, the officials, all of the people bowing, the repeated lists of the dignitaries, and it reaches a fevered pitch when Nebuchadnezzar now orders a personal ceremony just for these three. Now they're on the spot. Before, maybe they were hidden in a crowd of thousands. Others had to point them out. Now the spotlight is trained on these three. As the band strikes up the tune, and Nebuchadnezzar again commands that they worship the image at the end of the music. It's almost like a scene from a movie. The music swells louder and louder and louder, and at the end it stops. What are they going to do? There's a dramatic reversal in Nebuchadnezzar's attitude when he says, Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Remember the end of chapter 2 when Daniel had revealed and interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar had said, surely your God is a God of gods and your Lord a king of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Now he declares, I have power above all of the gods. I'm more powerful than yours. But the three friends, the music stops and they stand their ground. And then they answer the king really in a rather startling way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said to him, verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I've always liked how the King James Version put it. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. It's not an arrogant answer, but they're letting him know that we didn't really have to think about this. This is a decision that we've already made. This is a pre-commitment to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We didn't have to debate it. We didn't have to hold forums on it. We didn't have to go on Facebook and have a discussion about it. No, we are committed already to this. We don't have to answer carefully here because we've formulated our answer years ago when we professed our faith in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. What are they doing? They're reminding the king of their true authority, the true authority. And what the accusers say is true. They acknowledge it. We didn't bow down. Not only did we not bow down, but we don't need to defend our actions. Instead, they cast their, themselves upon the true king. If this be so, they said in verse 17, again, no arrogance here. There's tremendous humility in their answer, but perfect confidence in the omnipotent God. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known to you, O king, the, 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 by the, the, the repetition of O king in verses 17 and 18 is an indication of respect. They're not answering out of arrogance. They're not answering out of anger. They're not taunting him, as some Christians are wont to do. But out of respect, they simply say, if it not be that way, be it known to you that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They begin by acknowledging our God has the ability to save us, but they're also, also they're mindful of the possibility that they might be burned to ashes. Here they are in Babylon with an absolutely correct conception of the kingdom of Christ. 
they recognize that the glory of the kingdom may well be their death. They're okay with that. Their decision is against religious opinion. It's against public opinion. Their decision is made without bargaining with God. If we do this, will you do this? Their faithfulness wasn't contingent upon the promise of deliverance. They have no guarantee, every expectation, that they'll meet their death. And their decision, by the way, was professed in front of everybody. They weren't faithful in private, but quiet in public. But in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar's reaction might be predictable for an egotist. He's filled with fury. The expression of his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His countenance becomes distorted with anger. You can imagine him rising up, his face twisted in anger, shouting at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ordering the furnace to be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And it is. And how interesting that the ones loyal to the king meet their death in verses 20 through 22. These men then, the mighty men of his army bound to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, other garments. They were thrown into the burning fiery furnace because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Loyalty to the earthly king brought the godless death, not the life they expected. They faced an early judgment. They would face the greater judgment later. You saw that indication as we sang Psalm 7 a little bit earlier. Those who lift themselves up against God face God's judgment. The servants of the one who is defying the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is slain, while those who should have been killed are preserved. And that's where we see the deliverance of the Israelites. What comes of those who obey? Is there a God who can rescue them from the hands of a powerful ruler? Nebuchadnezzar himself gives the answer. Verse 25, he asked the question earlier, who is that God? No, he answers the question. In verse 25, he answered and said, I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not heard, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And the king quickly gets the message, and he orders the three of them out. And verse 21 makes a point of telling us some detail regarding their clothing that we read in verse 27. The satraps, prefects, governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloak was not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. It gives us detail about the way they're dressed. The Bible hardly ever gives us detail about the way people dress. It does here to let us know there wasn't a thread that is damaged. Not the slightest fiber that is singed or melts under the heat. There's not even the smell of fire, smoke on them at all. It's as if they hadn't been there. Nebuchadnezzar puts himself in the place of God he insists that he is the ultimate power of the universe from whose rage no God could ever hope to save a follower. And yet he learns what Moses writes in Deuteronomy 32. It is only the true God who can proclaim that no one can deliver them out of my hand. This is the God who had rescued his people from Egypt centuries before. And Moses wrote then, that God who brought you out of the iron-smelting furnace, out of Egypt, to be the people of his inheritance as you are now. What's happening in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the story of the fiery furnace? It's another deliverance. It's a replay of the deliverance from the exodus out of Egypt, the smelting furnace of Egypt, the deliverance of God as he guides his people out. But they didn't know that. They didn't, they didn't know as they were about to be thrown into the furnace, hey, this is not a problem because we're going to get tossed in the furnace. And just like in Egypt, uh, God's going to lead us through and we're going to come out the other side unscathed. They had no guarantee about their fate. All persecution can do, all persecution can do is set us free. Set us free from so many things, from pride, 
from selfishness, from contention, from love for the world. And in this persecution, we see their absolute faithfulness. We see their humility. We see that there is nothing that ties them to this earthly kingdom. Instead, this persecution ends up being bringing judgment to, to others. This testing first reveals Christ's presence to the tested and then to the testers. You know what persecution does and what this story does is focus our attention on Christ. Tertullian persecuted Tertullian is reported to have said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Charles Spurgeon said, Christ's church never sails so well as when she is rocked from side to side by the winds of persecution. And as a result of their testimony, they are seen to be followers of the true God. And Nebuchadnezzar responds in verse 28, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. And he set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. What a remarkable story of, of courage, a remarkable story of covenant fidelity, of faithfulness in the midst of the worst possible circumstances. And it's a challenge to us, isn't it? We face, I think, far less tragic in dangerous circumstances than these three. And yet, are we faithful? How do we apply this situation to our own? A passage like this, it might have, we think, a relevance perhaps to a Christian suffering in a Chinese prison. To be faithful, to be resolute in the face of danger and possibly death and martyrdom. But what can we gain for this, from this besides sympathy for those who are persecuted? I think we can see the seriousness of the challenge to the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are being told, essentially, simply this. Just demote your God. Demote your God. Worship him, that's fine. But worship this one too. Don't give him your exclusive loyalty. As Christians in the West not in the East, in the 21st century, not in the 7th century before Christ, 3,000 years later, we're being confronted with the same thing as these three expectant martyrs were confronted with as they stood before Nebuchadnezzar. And today, the threat of persecution may be distant, but is that really what the story is all about? Just persecution? It's the threat of idolatry. The threat of idolatry is so much more subtle than bowing down to a golden image in the face of peer pressure. Let me submit to your consideration the focal point of this text isn't necessarily on the potential for persecution, but in the very real and present danger of inclusivism and our need for the presence of Jesus Christ. The temptation that we face to dilute the worship of God so that we can appease the world around us. The pressure for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it didn't start when they stood before Nebuchadnezzar. It started when they stood with their peers. It started back in chapter 1. A number of years ago, Paul Tillich, a prominent theologian who I don't often quote for good reason, uh, but nevertheless, he occasionally, like a clock, uh, strikes the correct time at least twice a day. But he said this, A person's God is the thing or the person that one is most concerned about, thinks most about, or affects one's life the most. Really, the problem that we encounter in this age is very similar to the one encountered by these three faithful Jews. How are God's faithful to act in a faithless world? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't focus on the persecution. To them, what was at stake wasn't their lives. We're concerned about our safety. We're concerned about our 
social capital. We're concerned about our reputation. We're concerned uh, that we're secure. But Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, what was at stake here wasn't their safety and their security. It was the glory of God. If this be so, they said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. You know, in the third century, Origen wanted to throw himself in front of the emperor's chariot so that he could be a martyr. His plan was to throw himself in front of the emperor's chariot and proclaim Christ just as the chariot ran over him so that he could be martyred. A lot of Christians wanted to be martyred. They sought to be martyred. We saw that in our Wednesday evening classes. But this wasn't the Jews' approach here. They simply quietly held firm. Apparently, the king doesn't even notice them until a group of informants brings them to his attention. This is the ancient equivalent of the ACLU, I guess. Look what they're doing. But when they're brought to the hour of what could very well have been their death, they very calmly, they very boldly proclaim their faith without a moment's hesitation, their decision having already been made. The courage is remarkable. They don't seek death, but they don't shirk it. John Calvin famously wrote that the human mind is a factory of idols. And the issue that we're looking at today transcends the worship of a particular statue. But it instead concerns the constant threat to dilute the worship of the one true God by elevating anything or anyone to a comparable place of importance in our lives. And the temptation can come from anywhere to worship the golden image of yourself. And the temptation can come from a number of sources. Not all of them are bad at first. Our addictions can make pleasure an idol. We might seek power in order to control our world or have the resources of revenge against those who've wronged us. We can make relationships our idols. The list is vast, isn't it? And that's why the danger is so great. Idolatry, whether it's of Nebuchadnezzar's sort or the kind that you'll face this afternoon, ultimately has one object, one purpose. When all of the masks are ripped away from each idol, behind every idol is self. But what this story does is compel us to focus on the image of God, to focus on Christ. Nebuchadnezzar erects an image of God, doesn't he? He erects one that people can see, forces them to bow down to it. It's interesting, though, that the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the image to whom we bow down. He is the firstborn of the preeminent above all creation. Ultimately, what's at heart here is the second commandment. That's at the heart of the three Jews' resistance to the idolatry of Nebuchadnezzar. And it draws us, the second commandment, to Jesus Christ, the true image of God. Not the one on the field, but the one in the fire. The word and the image of God. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is not merely to show us how to act in persecution. It's to show us a person, Jesus Christ. Who's the fourth one in the fire? Who's the fourth one there? That's a question that's <laughs> intrigued commentators, well, probably for 3,000 years now since this happened. And Daniel doesn't say specifically, but Nebuchadnezzar says it. He looks like a son of the gods. That's, again, his perspective, but he has the look of divinity. It could simply have been an angel. He says that later as well. Is this a theophany? Is this the appearance of God himself? Or is this a Christophany, we would call it, the appearance of Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? We can't be absolutely certain. 
But if this is the angel of the Lord, we've seen this, we saw this certainly in the book of Genesis, the angel of the Lord, we have reason, good reason to believe, is the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ himself. It is God appearing in the flesh. Whether it is a Christophany or not, what's certain about that fourth person in the fire is that it represents the presence of God. And the Bible is full of the promise of the presence of God with his people. To be with you and never to forsake you. That God will be with you in your suffering. That God will be with you in your persecution. Isaiah chapter 42 or 43 rather, in verse 2, puts it this way. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The promise of God's presence is not that you'll be delivered from pain and suffering and sorrow. We saw that last week. The promise of the presence of God is what surpasses all of that. The most treasured promise we could ever possess. Not of life, physical life, not of health, not of freedom from pain or suffering or persecution, but the promise of the presence of God himself. In Romans chapter 8, Paul puts it this way. These words, I think you know, we've read them before. We saw them just a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 8. But in Romans chapter 8, Paul says this. I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The ultimate expression of God's presence isn't the appearance of this fourth person in the fire, but the ultimate expression of God's presence is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus Christ comes and he resists the temptation to bow down to Satan's will, resists the temptation even to accommodate Satan. We saw that in Luke chapter 4. Jesus Christ stands when Satan orders him to kneel. He refuses to do his will. He refuses to do the will of man, but do only the will of his Father. And Jesus Christ undergoes, as it were, hell's fiery furnace on the cross. We confessed it this morning. He descended into hell. What is the essence of hell? The essence of hell is the absence of the presence of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego enjoyed the presence of God in the furnace. Jesus Christ endured abandonment by God. In the fiery furnace of the cross, he endured our punishment, faithful unto death, that we might know the presence of God in life and in death. They faced death, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for refusing to bow down to the God of the Babylonians. Jesus Christ faced death because he himself is God, the true God, and there's no other. Having faith in Christ, then, our focus upon Christ, we might not fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul, but instead fear the one who can kill both body, destroy both body and soul in hell. Daniel 3 teaches us that we must not only resist idolatry, But we must resist idolatry, even to the point of death. We're rarely, Americans are hardly ever confronted with the kind of decision they're confronted with in terms of life and death kind of decision, a fiery furnace, the martyr's knife. Christians all over the world see it. We will, I think, one day. But we do know of Peter, who proclaimed that we must obey God rather than men. We know of the faithful men and women throughout the history of the church who have faithfully stood firm on the truth of God's revelation. The writer of Hebrews tells us that some faced jeers and flogging. Others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. 
They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended to their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What is that better thing? That is the presence of God himself in Jesus Christ. We stand in the stead of these faithful witnesses. Our charge is to hold the faith strong in the face of conformity, in the face of pressure, in the face even of persecution, in the face of idolatry that knocks constantly at the door of our heart. But it's not our goal to escape, but our goal is to walk into the furnace and there find Christ. There see Jesus their place our faith and trust in him and walk faithfully in obedience to him. Let us in this new year, in every passage that we read, see Jesus above all things. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that we might see Christ in this text. We might see that it points to God with us, your presence with us in all things, in life and in death, our faithful Savior. Help us then to walk obediently, courageously in covenant fidelity to you. In Christ's name, amen. Our hymn of response, Faith of Our Fathers, you'll find that in a bullet insert here. The flip side of what you sang before, 570, Faith of Our Fathers. Let's stand together and sing in response. indicate that the Lord's Supper will be observed next week. That's because I wasn't thinking ahead when I made the bulletins uh, this week. We now prepare for the Lord's Supper as we do the first Lord's Day of every month. Let me read to you from Matthew chapter 26, what we refer to as the words of institution. 
As they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given it to them, given thanks rather, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance which is to be observed until he comes again. It is one of two sacraments that we practice, baptism, and then we improve upon our baptism through obedience. Part of that obedience then is that second sacrament as we come to the Lord's Supper. It's not a memorial of Christ's sacrifice, or I should say not simply a memorial of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is also a means of grace. The Lord's Supper is a means by which God grants to us a sanctifying grace, strengthens us in the faith, that we might take the Word of God, which we've heard. The Word of God is always present where the sacrament is present. We don't have little private communion services on the side kind of thing. It's always in the presence of the preaching of God's Word. that The Holy Spirit might take the Word of God that has been preached and might work in our hearts through that Word, a sanctifying grace that we might become more like Christ, whom we've seen in the text, and less like this world. The wine and the bread represent the crucified body, the shed blood, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful covenant keeper, who does what God himself declared that he would do and took upon himself the curses of the covenant, as we saw in Genesis chapter 15, as God's legs, as it were, pillars of fire, walk between the torn flesh and the spilled blood of the sacrificial offering. And the Lord's Supper not only commemorates what Christ has done for us, but anticipates what he will do for us in anticipation of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is my privilege as a minister of Christ to invite all who are right with God through our Lord Jesus Christ to come to the Lord's table. If you have received Christ and you are resting upon him for salvation as he's offered to you in the gospel, if you are a baptized and professing communicant member in good standing of a church that professes the gospel of God's free grace in Christ, if you live penitently, you seek to walk in godliness before the Lord, then I invite you this morning to the Lord's table. However, if you do not live penitently, if you are not a member of of a faithful Bible-believing church, if you've not made a profession of faith in Christ Jesus, I urge you not to come to the table lest you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. The warning that Paul gives us that we so often read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, again, isn't designed to keep us away, but it's to invite us to come, to make right those things that are wrong that we might be able to come to the table of the Lord. So let's take a few moments. Let's examine our hearts that we might indeed come with a good, good and clear conscience to the Lord's table to fellowship with him through this spiritual feast. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what we heard earlier in the service today, the assurance of pardon, that we can confess our sins and that you forgive us our sins, that you are faithful, that you are just in this. We thank you for the Lord's table. We thank you for the promise of redemption that it pictures. We thank you for the means of grace that it is. We thank you that it is one of two visual symbols of redemption that you give us in your word that the church is to practice and perpetuate until you come again. We thank you that you have received the offering that we have brought, having come with clean hands and pure hearts through the intercession of our beloved Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we ask, O Lord, that as you tell us in your word, you would feed us with the body and the blood of Christ, that we might grow in grace. Unto Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved congregation, lift up your hearts from these visible elements, even to heaven itself, where we look for Christ Jesus to come and to perfect our redemption. All of the promises of God are yes and amen. And so 
with faithful hearts, with Christian love, and with great joy of the anticipation of the coming again of Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now and receive the promise of God through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Our Lord Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body. May you eat and do it.
that he for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the boundary of their salvation perfect and suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one glory to God. That is why we are not ashamed to call them brothers. So when I was well of your name, my brother, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing the praise. And again, I will put my trust in you. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver on those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. But surely it is not angels that are helped, but it helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the holy calling, consider Jesus. Apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house is more honored than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that they were supposed to lay to. Christ is faithful in God's house as a son. And we are his half if indeed we hold fast our hope and our boasting and our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of Pastor Jordan, <coughs> where the prophets put me to test. You saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to test my mercy. You said they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. They swore in my wrath. They stumbled at my death. Take care, brothers. Lest there be any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of evil. For we share in Christ if we do the will of our good and constant son, and again. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who had evil things to be led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned and whose bodies were all in the wilderness? And who did he swear that they would not utter his wrath? But to those who were believed, he was seen that they were unable to enter him. Let's stand together and sing the God song. And then just wanted to mention one thing before uh, we go. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and abide with you all, both now and always. Amen. Uh, we'll sing our closing response. By the way, it's different. You've been singing Psalm 117 for two years now. And so I decided to switch it up. You're singing Psalm 23. So you'll find that at the bottom of your bullets in the words there. Uh, before we go, <clears throat> let me express my apologies to Mackenzie for surprising her with uh, the, the doxology. Oh, okay. Well, so was I, apparently, when I did the bulletin. So um, 
totally missed it altogether. But also, let me express my thanks to you as a congregation for your kindness to me and to my family uh, with your Christmas gift. I have a, a thank you letter on the bulletin board in the back uh, if you want to take a few moments and uh, read that. Uh, this is my, uh, this was our 10th Christmas here, and it just gets better and better. We're so grateful uh, to all of you. Love you all very much. And thank you. Uh, let's sing now together Psalm 23.